welcome uh, everyone and thanks for coming along. Uh, this will be uh, a session where we hopefully uh, delve a little further into the topic of nucleation kinetics. Um, based around the notes that I have distributed on the uh, YouTube, on the TYC page, and also the videos that you can see on, uh, on YouTube. Um, I guess there's only three of you. Uh, that's rather a small number, but that uh, doesn't stop us from having a useful discussion. Uh, it does stop us uh, possibly in having breakout sessions. I was going to send you into breakout rooms for discussion purposes. Uh, I can still do that, but I think it'll just be one breakout room, uh, which can still work. I think that's what I should do. Okay, um, so have any of you had the time to look at the videos that I put up on uh, YouTube or that Karen put on, up on YouTube? Uh, all of you? At least part of it? Uh, to be honest, I remember that uh, the videos were uploaded at the beginning of the year, so I watched them at that time, but I didn't rewatch them for this session. <laughs> Okay, you've watched them before, that's fine, that's, that's, that's good enough. Um, well, that's, if not everyone is familiar with the videos, what I'll, I'll do then is to sketch out the basic framework, the basic pictorial uh, arguments uh, behind nucleation modelling. Uh, I'll do that here on my, on my whiteboard at home. I might have to readjust the camera to make it visible. Um, but actually, we don't need to draw much on the whiteboard because we can simply discuss it a little bit. Um, if after the lectures you want to look further into it, into it uh, then the lectures exist, the recorded lectures exist, and the notes exist. I've got uh, extensive notes uh, for you to take a look at. They're drawn from my fourth year course, my master's level course on statistical mechanics, where I discuss equilibrium and non-equilibrium statistical mechanical uh, modeling methods uh, in detail. But one of the areas which is very close to my heart is nucleation modeling, phase transitions um, and how they occur. So first of all, um, just to break the ice somewhat, no pun intended, can each of you tell me where you're from? What uh, what college are you from? What university are you from? I'd be interested to know. So, Gustavo, where are you from? Yeah, I'm from Imperial College London. Um, okay. I'm a fifth year PhD student at the Chemical Engineering Department. Okay, okay, good, good. Uh, Fegal, what about you? Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Imperial College London as well, uh, the Department of Chemistry, and um, first year PhD student in Computational Chemistry. Okay, two imperial so far. Huan Yu Zhao, what about you? No, um, I also come from Imperial College and uh, I'm a year one PhD student in crystallization to be specific. To be specific. And uh, I, I'm also based in the Department of Chemistry. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Three imperial people. Uh, Kian, um, Welcome. Where are you based? What, what department are you in? Hi. Um, well, to the surprise of everyone, I'm also from Imperial College from the physics department. So I guess we have Imperial group today. We certainly do. Uh, what about Tija? What about you? Where are you from? I wonder if you can hear me. OK, well, Welcome all of you, Imperial people. It looks like it's a UCL service to Imperial students today, but I'm sure it all evens out in the end. And you're all kind of chemists. You have a chemical background. Well, not all of you. Um, there was a certain flavour amongst you of, of chemistry backgrounds, which is fine because, of course, condensed matter physics is at the boundaries of chemistry and physics. And nucleation kinetics is is rather at the boundary, very much at the boundary, um, particularly the way we, we model it with thermodynamics and with 
rate equations, all this is actually very familiar uh, to, to a chemical background. So um, what do you know about nucleation? Uh, what can I, uh, what, might some, what might somebody tell me they currently or previously knew about nucleation, the phenomenon of nucleation? Is, is anyone able to give me some, uh, some information about nucleation? Well, by the way, the newcomers, if you would like to, would you switch on your cameras? It would be more social and interesting. If you wish, not to break it through. Okay, what is nucleation? Anyone? Well, I learned some basics about uh, classical nucleation in theory. And uh, it first climb up the potential energy surface and uh, to form a stable atomic cluster. And then the energy drops down. And uh, so the, the, the nucleation process becomes simultaneous because the potential energy drops down. And then the, the, the molecules or atoms from gas or liquid phase will turn into liquid or solid phase. Excellent, yes, yes. You've got a lot of, of stuff in there. Um, molecules that sit below some kind of hill, some kind of barrier, yeah. Yeah. in order for them to condense, to make a liquid or to make some, some additional phase, maybe a solid or, or, or whatever, they have to overcome this barrier in order to make this change. Um, not every phase transition has a barrier, uh, yes, impedes it, uh, but many of them do, and they're all called first order phase transitions. Have you come across any other kind of phase transitions, by the way? Uh, I, I learned it during my undergraduate student uh, study, and uh, it's called sig second kind of phase transition, but I'm, I don't know it in super detail. Yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's a, a kind of a niche thing. There are second order phase transitions that don't have a barrier, um, and they they proceed smoothly um, rather than abruptly because the nucleation phenomenon of overcoming a barrier implies it turns out that the event is is abrupt. So it's it's like a snap of a finger. It's like a, the waving of a magic wand and something goes uh, rapidly into a new phase. For example, um, if you have a, a super cool liquid, uh, water below zero degrees centigrade, if you're very, very careful, you can keep it liquid because there's a, a little barrier that prevents the freezing from taking place. Uh, but if, you, if you're really, really careful, <laughs> To be honest, I've been trying to do this with my freezer with a bottle of water repeatedly. And if you're very careful, you can take the super cooled water and you can shake it or pour it out and it, it will immediately freeze. It, it is like a magic wand. There is a, an immediate and dramatic change of phase that takes place. It's not a continuous thing. It's a, a, it's a rapid and discontinuous event. The first order phase transition is impeded by a barrier, and this, this barrier is overcome by the process of nucleation. Uh, and that's really, that's, that's essentially the topic of this, this, this discussion here. Um, but you refer to it as a potential energy barrier, um, which isn't quite correct. So I wonder if anyone else can add to that picture. Is it, a, is it something other than a potential energy barrier? And by the way, again, welcome to newcomers. Uh, if you are able to, you could switch your cameras on. It would be pleasant, um, but not obligatory. So the question is, what is this barrier made of? Isn't also an interfacial uh, 
energy barrier related to it? Uh, well, yes, absolutely. The, the barrier is made up of an interfacial component, but a component of what kind? And here's a clue, it's not energy. It's not an interfacial energy that appears in that barrier, but an interfacial something else. Can anyone add the magic word to the word energy to make what the barrier is made of? It's blank energy. Supply the word. It's free energy. It's free energy. And free energy is not energy. It's an energy minus an entropy, an entropy times a temperature. Um, it's a thermodynamic potential that the system rises over. Uh, it's, it's not just energy. Uh, we, we, we have ideas of systems rising over energy surfaces, like a, a ball being projected up the side of a hill. That's climbing an energy surface until it might reach the top and roll down the other side. But this, this concept of nucleation doesn't involve climbing up a, an energy barrier. It's a, it's a free energy barrier. It's a thermodynamic potential barrier. Um, and I think it might be worth just sketching that on my whiteboard, which I hope you can see. But a bright window in front of me, which kind of distorts the, obscures the, the writing. Can you see a, see anything on my whiteboard? It's kind of- Yeah. Okay. Um, as a function of the size N, if I stand up, you won't be able to see me, but never mind, it's not important. As a function of the size of the new phase, there is a rising and a falling thermodynamic barrier. And the barrier that I want to draw to your attention is called an availability barrier. An availability is a, is a thermodynamic potential. It's not one that you often come across, but it's written in this form. It's a Helmholtz free energy, F, minus mu times n. And this describes the way in which a cluster of new phase, condensed phase, grows um, out of a monomer of that phase, out of a, a single molecule. And this thermodynamic barrier, this availability barrier, is the very profile that the system has to rise over, rise up and overcome in order to nucleate. And it is not an easy task to do so because free energies are uh, the second law of thermodynamics demands that free energies are minimized. You chemists will be very familiar with this. The second law of thermodynamics, which you're familiar with, in uh, rewritten in a form suitable to this situation, demands that free energies are minimized in the world. The world does not like creating free energy. It does not like a system to acquire free energy. So if we're stuck, if a, if a system is stuck on the left-hand side of this barrier, it has to overcome this barrier by um, bending the rules of the world and increasing its free energy, increasing its thermodynamic potential. And that is not something the, the world likes to do. It is therefore uh, uh, something one has to wait for. It is a, uh, a, a chance event that um, carries the system over the barrier. And that chance event is the nucleation of the phase transition. The sun has come out. I'm looking at um, a bright sky, and therefore you're looking at a very overexposed version of me. So I'll have to dodge the sun as much as I can. Sorry about that. So is any of this familiar to you? Have you? Uh, uh, Juan, you, you say you've, you've come across this idea of overcoming a barrier. Have you come, has, has any of you come across this situation in any other area of physics or chemistry? 
not in not just in molecules sticking together to make a cluster of a new phase. Any other areas? I mean, in chemical reactions, you usually see that. Yeah, yeah, chemical reactions are all about this, aren't they? Now, the difference there is that it's not a chemical reaction where lots of molecules come together and stick together. What's happening there is that the, the molecules are there in the reaction chamber and they're just attaching to one another to make a new, uh, a new phase. There's no change of total number of atoms in a reaction inside a closed chamber. The reaction is proceeding and simply producing product chemicals out of reactant chemicals, isn't it? But nevertheless, uh, there is a barrier picture involved, isn't there, with a free energy that is being climbed. Um, the difference in nucleation of phase transitions is that it's a gross change in the number of particles in a phase rather than reaction between A and B giving AB. Uh, in a phase transition, it's a million atoms of A in, in a gas phase turning into a million atoms of A in a liquid phase. And it's, it's, it's similar to, but slightly different to reaction kinetics. But you're right, in reaction kinetics, you come across barriers and you talk about their overcoming. And if that is a familiar area, can you tell me what the rate of reaction is in terms of the height of the barrier? And supposedly it's related to the difference of the git free energy. Yeah. So yeah, the there is an exponential in there with the free git free energy. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's <laughs> exactly. If you can see that still. I yeah, guess. yeah, we can. Um, yeah. So the chemists in the audience will be familiar with reaction kinetics that goes as an exponential in the delta G gives free energy change of a reaction for A and B going to AB. And that delta G is, is a consequence of the rearranging of the atoms and the binding together, I guess, of the atoms to make a new product. Well, this very picture applies in phase transitions as well, except it's not a delta G, but a delta A. It's a, a different thermodynamic potential uh, because it's a different process. But nevertheless, we would expect that the rate of the nucleation of the new phase would go as an exponential in a delta A, a delta availability potential. And that's exactly what the, the notes prove. Or, there's, there's a derivation of a rate of nucleation, a rate of barrier crossing in the notes that goes as an exponential, goes as a, a Boltzmann factor, a kind of Arrhenius factor. That's possibly uh, a person, a name that is familiar to the chemists in the, in the audience here. Arrhenius, you've come across Arrhenius expressions. Uh, he was a chemist who studied reaction rates and found that they went as an exponential of some free energy, delta G over K2. So nucleation is a bit like chemical kinetics, but it's more elaborate. That's, that's what it is. Um, do phase transitions happen in areas outside condensed matter physics and in chemistry, do we know? Does anyone, can anyone comment on phase transitions outside condensed matter physics? They are more widespread. They... Can, can you repeat the question, please? <laughs> um, a phase transition, gas to liquid, liquid to solid, is commonplace in condensed matter physics. And I'm just asking if anyone has come across the idea of a phase transition outside gases, liquids, and solids, and liquid crystals, and all kinds of condensed matter areas 
has anyone ever come across discussions of phase transitions elsewhere? No, no at, at least I haven't. <laughs> no, no absolute reason why you should. But um, phase transitions are discussed in other fields of science. Um, in cosmology, for example, it is supposed that the, the quantum uh, fields of the early universe undertook phase transitions, which brought about different modes of expansion, in fact, triggered the expansion of the universe. Okay, that's highly speculative. No one's doing experiments in that area, but the, the language that is used to describe that event is, a, is one of phase transitions. Um, and similarly, the Higgs mechanism in particle physics, whereby the Higgs field uh, takes a value initially that is uh, that that does not produce mass massive particles electrons with mass for example um, that situation was then uh, changed through a phase transition so it is alleged that brought about a non-zero higgs field in the universe and gave masses to all the particles because they they interacted with this non-zero Higgs field. So phase transitions are, are universal, quite literally, uh, but we are studying them. I, I study them. I've studied them for over 20 years in the context of condensed matter physics. And that's where, um, that's where most is known about them because you can perform experiments and study rates of transition um, and try to model them try to understand them on the basis of the interactions between the molecules. Let me tell you about classical nucleation theory. Now, so classical nucleation theory has been around since the 1930s. It was, it's extremely old now, 90 years old, nearly. And the classical nucleation theory is based upon a continuum idea of what the availability barrier is, what the free energy barrier is. Um, in the 1930s, they didn't know, they couldn't calculate microscopic properties of clusters, the microscopic free energy of the surface, the interface. So instead, uh, Becker and During and others decided they would model the free energy barrier as an interfacial component and a volume component. Even though the cluster didn't really have an interface, a sharp interface, a cluster is a messy time evolving assembly of molecules, who is to say where the interface is. But nevertheless, the classical nucleation theory regards a cluster of molecules as a shiny spherical liquid drop. Even if it's composed of well, two molecules, it's regarded as a spherical shiny liquid drop and is modeled accordingly. In other words, the free energy of such a barrier consists of an interfacial part and a volume part with properties associated with a, a large droplet, a, a droplet of size one millimeter or one centimeter, scaled down to the molecular scale. And this is the classical theory of nucleation. And with it, I'm going to show you my screen of my. Uh, whiteboard again. With it, it's possible to create a, math a mathematical model of this barrier, and it takes the form of a rising part, which goes as n to the two thirds, which is a, a surface contribution, and then a descending part, which goes as n, which is a volume contribution. Um, in other words, the cluster is visualized as a, a sphere which grows as it overcomes the barrier, but it has the properties of this continuum droplet throughout with a surface energy, a surface free energy, and a volume free energy, which is also known as a, a chemical potential. And, and this is the classical theory. So delta uh, 
G, well, we'll call it A or delta A, is some coefficient into n two thirds minus another coefficient, which I'm going to call delta mu into n. And this, this is a, a long standing model of the nucleation barrier. Theta is just a temperature dependent quantity which is related to the surface tension of the continuum liquid. And delta mu is the, the driving chemical potential difference that, uh, that, that suggests that a phase transition is likely. Delta mu is the difference between the chemical potential of the old phase uh, and that of the new phase. And if that is a positive quantity, then it's a driving force towards a phase transition. So delta mu is a chemical potential difference between the old phase and the new phase. So that's a positive coefficient, so is this, and it gives rise to a barrier of this kind. And then um, with these simple components, it's possible to work out what is the size n star corresponding to the peak in the barrier, and what is the what is the height delta a star of the barrier? In other in, in other words, then one can put that height into the Arrhenius factor, and um, also come to a conclusion as to what is the size of cluster that you you need to make in order for the phase transition to proceed. What is the critical size cluster beyond which it's all downhill? And the classical theory provides some, uh, some means of assessing these quantities. Um, now, remarkably, this model, the classical theory of nucleation, initiated in the 1930s, is still with us. It's still in all the textbooks. It's taught in all the courses on barrier crossing, on phase transitions, because uh, A, it's simple. And B, it's remarkably accurate in some cases, although it's remarkably inaccurate in, in other cases. But for some cases, for example, water near room temperature, if you do experiments on creating a, a mist of water droplets and a supersaturated gas of water vapor, um, if you compare the experimental rate of production of droplets, to classical nucleation theory, it's, it works remarkably. And it has no right to do so, but it does. Uh, even, if, even when the critical size is only about 40 molecules, the, a, a cluster of 40 molecules is not a spherical droplet of water. It's a messy, time-dependent uh, object assembly. And nevertheless, the free energy barrier can be captured with classical nucleation theory for water in some circumstances. Uh, and that's why classical nucleation theory is still taught in spite of it being extraordinarily uh, badly founded. The cluster does not look like one of these. It looks like, for water, it'll look like a bunch of water molecules all sticking together with hydrogen bonds, I guess. And it won't look like a sphere and it won't be static. Um, if I had control over my screen, I would be able to show you some calculations of the surface tension of water of molecule of, of, of only a few molecules and its surface tension, its effective surface tension is remarkably close to that of a large droplet, which is the uh, which is a curiosity. Nevertheless, for some substances, liquid, the, the condensation of argon, the gas argon into liquid droplets in classical nucleation theory, uh, the, the rate differs from experiment by 27 orders of magnitude. So sometimes classical nucleation theory can fail terribly. And it's because not all clusters look like little droplets like I've sketched here on the board. Any, any, does uh, anyone want to 
make any observations, any comments about what I've been describing. Uh-huh. Well. Uh, are there any other theories uh, that could take account, uh, account of the shape of the, of the well, cluster? Well, yes. Yes. Um, in order to do better than classical nucleation theory, you have to evaluate the free energy, the free energy of a cluster of n particles. Uh, how would you do that? accurately and microscopically well you have to write down and, and and evaluate a partition function i mean all free energies are related to partition functions which are phase space integrals all with the of, of the boltzmann factor of a configuration if, if that is familiar to you let me make some space here so e to the minus f over kt of any system is a partition function and a partition function is a multiple uh, integral over the positions and momenta divided by some power of the Planck constant into a Boltzmann factor which is the Hamiltonian of the system divided by kt so to do better than classical nucleation theory, all you have to do is evaluate this integral. But if it's a cluster of 40 molecules, that means there are six times 40 integration variables, 240 integration variables in three dimensions. There's a momentum and a position for each particle, and each of those is a vector the vector position and the vector momentum so there's six n integrals to do and for 40 particles that's 240 integrals and that isn't an integral we want to do very easily very very often if at all and if you're talking about a thousand molecules well it's just impossible to do so what we're touching upon here is the general difficulty of evaluating partition functions in statistical physics. Uh, I don't know if this will ever come up in your research, but statistical physics is beset with a dimension, a, a problem of dimensions. It's, it, partition functions are high dimensional integrals. They, they are what we, we need. The free energy is often what is needed to describe the stability of, of a structure, but we can't readily calculate it. There have to be some, some clever techniques, and there have been a number of clever techniques over the years. Some of them are numerical. In fact, I'd say the majority of them are numerical methods for uh, calculating free energies. Um, and what I, what I have shown you in my notes which I can see on my screen here, but it's frozen. In my notes, towards the very end, there's a, a calculation of the effective surface tension of a droplet of water, a calculation made by a former student of mine uh, in five years ago, six years ago now. A very laborious calculation of the surface free energy of a cluster of water molecules down to size three and up to about, I forget now, up to perhaps 27 or possibly 50, I can't recall. But these are laborious calculations um, because of the dimensionality of the, due to the extent of the configuration space and the need to consider all sorts of contributions to this integral here. So one can write half a PhD on a calculation of a free energy of a simple, a very relatively simple system. These are laborious tasks and it goes beyond free energy calculation and the problem involved there goes beyond nucleation modeling. It goes into all sorts of areas in condensed matter physics, trying to assess relative stability of phases. 
uh, uh, trying to assess reaction pathways in, in chemistry. All of this requires the calculation of a free energy surface. And this is a laborious task. So yes, one can do better than classical nucleation theory, but they are all laborious. And people have been trying for a long time to improve classical nucleation theory in a variety of ways. Uh, simply by finding, looking for corrections to this curve, this simple curve rising as the two thirds power surface like, descending as the volume, looking for corrections to this form uh, is a fruitful approach, but um, there has not been a, a a general, there's not a consensus on how to improve on classical nucleation theory, in spite of many years of effort. So, but one can still write half a PhD on calculating rates of nucleation and, uh, and comparing them with experiments, etc. Okay. Um, There was one of the questions that was I posed was, is it possible, are, are we justified, I, I'm rephrasing the question, are we justified in classical nucleation theory, in the Becker-During equations, are we justified in writing down the process of growth and evaporation of a cluster as a Markovian stochastic process. Are we justified in doing that? That was one of the questions I, that is addressed, that one has to address. Do we know what Markovian means? Could you repeat the question, please? The, the question is, uh, okay, I'll, I'll rephrase it once again. Classical nucleation theory and Becker-During theory uses Markovian rate equations. Um, do we know what, do, do we all understand what Markovian means? Okay, well Markovian processes are those that happen with no memory of previous events. So a Markovian stochastic process is a re repeated tossing of a coin where we are pretty sure that the result of the next tossing of the coin doesn't depend upon the result of the previous tossing of the coin. It's a process without memory. The only matter, uh, the only, the, the statistics of the outcomes are entirely uh, encoded in the present situation of the system. Uh, it's a tossing of a coin, it's a 50-50 division between head and tails. But what if, what if that were not the case? What if we had a, a random system which had memory of its previous, its, its previous uh, configuration. So instead of having a 50-50 chance of head or tails in the tossing of a coin, it was 60-40 in favor of heads if the previous uh, result was a heads or some other difference from 50-50. That, that is a situation we, we do encounter in in, in the modeling of complex systems, random events that have memory on the past. They, they have a memory of perhaps the previous configuration or a whole series of previous configurations. You can certainly imagine uh, a, a coin with memory of its previous results, such that it was, was a 60-40 uh, in favor of heads, if it was previously heads. Now that is a, a, a situation which could apply in cluster growth and evaporation. And we have assumed, Becker and During assumed that it was not of that kind, that there was no memory, that the next growth or evaporation event, which is analogous to heads or tails, was, was independent of whether the cluster had previously grown or had previously evaporated. So 
that is a, an assumption which could be questioned, in which case becker during equations would have to be replaced with something else. And that is a, that is a, a flaw, a potential flaw in the classical nucleation theory on top of the assumption of continuum free energies. And, and indeed there are, um, one of my PhD students is, in, is investigating non-Markovian cluster kinetics barrier crossing according to non-Markovian rules of growth and decay, growth and evaporation. So there are avenues that are open to, 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 be, to questioning in nucleation kinetic modeling. Um, So does, does that make sense, this business of Markovian and non-Markovian kinetics? It's, it's not something I've discussed in the notes because it's rather advanced, but I want you to not believe classic, I think, I guess, I, I don't want you to go away thinking that classical nucleation theory, which some of you will have encountered, is the way to model nucleation events. That is not the case because it doesn't always work. When it happens to work, it's a mystery why it should work. So, uh, well, I'm wondering what other issues to raise here. This is this, of course, is. It's not, it was not my intention that I should be doing all the talking. I was hoping that the breakout rooms would enable discussions to be to nucleate between you so that there would be comments on these matters coming back to the to in, in the main room. So I'm wondering whether there are any questions that you have about. Uh, about the notes, about the videos, about what I've described here. Um, hmm. then I don't think we're going to be needing the entire two hours of the tutorial. I think I, I, I will pose a, a couple more questions from my list. I can find it on my screen, it's still frozen. Okay, well, I'll, I'll ask the following question. When what is the lowest temperature do you think you can cool water to before it freezes? It may sound like a trick question. It's, I guess it is really. At what temperature does water freeze? I mean, that depends on the pressure, but we sh there should be a, a part of where there is a metastable uh, liquid phase and before it freezes. Okay, sure. Uh, let's, let's imagine it's at room pressure. That's all the time. Um, but you're absolutely right. You can create a metastable liquid that is below zero degrees centigrade. That's the quoted freezing point of water, isn't it? But you can reduce the temperature below freezing, as I have been attempting to demonstrate with that success recently with water in my freezer. But what do you think is the lowest temperature that you can reach before it freezes? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Is it minus five degrees? That sounds quite cold. Minus 273.
somewhere in between. Well, I'll give you the answer. It's, it's very possible to reduce water to minus 40 cells centigrade and it for, for it still to remain liquid. Minus 40 is quite a long way down. And the reason it doesn't freeze is that there is this tiny barrier that is just making it really difficult for the water to adopt an ice structure. It, it wishes to, it knows it has to, the second law is telling it to, but getting there involves this barrier. It involves the, the, the increase uh, over a free energy barrier locally, temporarily, but that's enough to make it possible to maintain its liquid-like uh, structure below, well below zero degrees at minus 40. And we, we can observe this. Uh, we don't have to go into a lab and cool down liquid water and, and, and watch it until it freezes. You can do that, but you can just look up at the sky occasionally and see plenty of supercooled water. Now that's to say clouds, cloud droplets. There are clouds up there, uh, possibly today, maybe, which are supercooled. They would like to be ice. The local temperature is below zero degrees, but they're unable to form the clusters at sufficient rate to freeze the entire droplet. So they remain liquid-like the supercooled clouds. And you can tell whether a cloud is, is liquid or ice by its, uh, its appearance. The very, very fluffy or very feather-like clouds that you sometimes see in the sky, the so-called cirrus clouds, they are ice particles. They're very high up where it's colder and they're, they're distinctive feather-like appearance is, uh, is an aspect of being ice particles rather than uh, liquid droplets. They look different because they scatter light differently. Uh, water, spherical water droplets scatter light differently compared to crystal lights of ice. So they look different because they're different in their structure. Uh, and this has a climatic effect as well. Um, clouds affect the climate. They, scatter solar radiation differently depending on which which phase they're in so um, some of these clouds are at minus 40 degrees before they freeze when they do they have a different effect on the radiation uh, scattering so you, you can see supercooled metastable phases quite readily just up in the sky um, and there are lots of materials which are held in their metastable state by virtue of these nucleation barriers, uh, the, either for a long time or, or for a short time. Uh, the one that comes to mind is, is diamond, which is a metastable solid structure of carbon, as you know. At room temperature and pressure, it wants to be graphite, really. It ought to be graphite but it is not, it is held in its structure because in order to take that structure, that diamond structure, and to form a, a little nucleus of graphite within it, that's, that's a, a massively unlikely event. It requires a nucleus of the graphite to form with an interface that really costs a great amount of free energy. And the chemical potential difference is not sufficient to drive the transition there is a barrier which is far too high for the system to overcome and this is why diamond remains uh, forever as they say in spite of it being metastable with respect to graphite so the existence of nucleation barriers is it has, has significant effects in the world around us, in the atmosphere, in the materials around us. Um, 
sometimes that's a good thing or sometimes it's something you want to somehow overcome in order to make a change happen 